My name's Paul White. I've been working in alternative media for a number of years now and researching a variety of arcane realities. And in the course of this, we established a project some years ago called Missing Links, which grew out of our fascination with uh, what's now known as the Earth Energy Grid. Back at the time, we were just beginning to hear things about ley lines and energy flows through the Earth and uh, the Earth's electromagnetic field and uh, found it referred to as uh, dragon paths in one part of the world and song lines in our own part of the world. We discovered to our surprise that the local Aboriginal people had a very developed and secret tradition about the energies that interconnected all of the sacred sites. And uh, talking with them, it became obvious that uh, there was very different kinds of energies and all sorts of strange things going on that uh, weren't familiar to us. And then uh, we began to find references to this energy grid in the ancient records. And the fact that uh, pyramids and uh, the temples built on the key nodal points around the world had some sort of strange significance and implied the existence of some kind of ancient technology, a technology perhaps beyond machine technology as we know. Existence of some kind of ancient technology, a technology perhaps beyond machine technology as we know found some correlation between UFO um, occurrences and this Earth grid phenomena. That's right. I, I've, I've found that there, there are numerous grid patterns um, that describe the, uh, describe the world and describe the energy lines on the world. The grid pattern that I, I'm most interested in is one called the becker hagens grid pattern, which is a grid pattern that's actually based on the five platonic um, solids which we use in everyday life, with the cube, triangle, octahedron and so forth. This particular grid pattern points out 4,682 different locations around the world where um, there is a potential for strange and unusual phenomena to take place. What's particularly interesting is that in these particular locations, right throughout the, the centuries and the millennia, our forefathers and our ancestors have actually gone to these places and used them as their sacred sites, places where they will go and have what we might call shamanistic experiences, out-of-body experiences, where they may commune with their, their guides or their spirits or their animal totems. So there is a tradition of such experiences in these places around the world throughout the folklore and so on? Very much so. In every, in every country around the world, from Africa to America to Australia to Britain, uh, through all, all the way through Europe, any of the sacred sites around England, the old monolithic circles, for example, are actu actually fit closely into this grid pattern, and it's in these areas that people, even today, will be having, uh, will have unusual experiences. As a starting point, how did you come to stumble across the whole notion of there being some kind of 
grid system around the planet? Mm, that was a long process. Um, my interest started back in, way back in 1952, when um, I actually sighted what we generally call a UFO over the Manico Harbour in Auckland. And, um, I knew then there was something up there that was strange. It was definitely not an aeroplane in those days. So I naturally got curious and kept looking for them in the future. I went, I went through sighting reports and picked out all the ones that were hovering over positions, plotted them out on a map and found that they're all in grid lines. So you began to look for mathematical relationships mm. between the plotted points? Well, not at that stage. I considered then I'd probably find a, found a section of a world system. So I had to wait again until this came up. Now that, um, this is Harmonix 33. Yeah, yeah, that thing was photographed on the, the seabed off South America. And it was 13,500 feet under the surface. And we actually visited the ship that um, it was taken from. We talked to a couple of the scientists that happened to be there at the time, and they said it was an artifact. In other words, it wasn't a plant or anything. They'd given the actual position of that in latitude and longitude. So I calculated the opposite position on the other side of the world in Siberia, then spent a week or so drawing patterns on a plastic board to find some sort of a system, mm -hmm. a pattern, mm -hmm. as a hunch, and then hung that pattern on those two positions and swung it around until I fitted the section I found in New Zealand and found it fitted, just slotted straight into it. So that was a relationship from two sides of the world mm. on a... It was, it, it was still just a hunch at that stage. I didn't know whether I'd fit it or not, but mm. um, I just carried on from that point and then um, had a good look at the polar sections of the system and broke it down into mathematics and found I could apply that to speed of light, gravity and um, mass. The notion that the Earth has a basic harmonic symmetry is very ancient. Even Socrates told his pupils that the real Earth viewed from above is supposed to look like one of those balls made from 12 pieces of skin sewn together. Some 2,000 years later, three Russian scientists called Goncharov, Morozov and Makarov had the idea of examining the globe to see if there was any pattern linking significant historical sites. There was. Like Captain Bruce Cathy in New Zealand, the Russian researchers found a precise and recurring geometric pattern connecting key sites from Egypt to China. They had discovered a worldwide latticework pattern, an energy matrix as they put it, that was built into the structure of the Earth. They made the interesting suggestion that Earth had begun life as a giant crystal whose orbital spin had moulded the plastic magma into a sphere. The Russian research described 12 large pentagonal grids covering the globe, a dodecahedron, overlaid with 12 equilateral triangles. At the same time, in the United States, Ivan Sanderson, researcher into the unexplained, began plotting areas around the globe where magnetic anomalies and other energy aberrations were linked to a full spectrum of strange physical phenomena. He developed a 12-point icosahedron grid that linked these places. These 12 key areas of strange energy effects in the pattern of an icosahedron were also mapped out by scientist J.J. Hertak in 1977. Then in the late 70s, the American scientific team Bill Becker and Betty Hagen combined the two areas of research producing a combination icosa and dodecahedron. The overlapping icosa dodecahedron grid has now been adopted by almost all grid researchers except Bruce Cathy, who's developed unique mathematics working with a cube octahedron grid. The lines and intersection points on the Becker-Hagen grid were found to match the Earth's seismic fracture zones and ocean ridge lines, as well as outlining world atmospheric patterns, paths of migratory animals and nomadic peoples, gravitational anomalies, the sighting of ancient civilizations and the worldwide enigma of pyramids. Famous points on the grid include the Great Pyramid, Easter Island, Maralinga in Australia, Nazca in Peru, Angor Wat in Cambodia, Stonehenge and so on. 
So it's only now becoming clear to latter-day researchers that knowledge of the Earth's biomagnetic field is very ancient and has been utilised by civilizations in prehistory. First of all, too, I tend to believe that civilization and uh, particularly advanced civilizations go back a lot farther than, uh, than most archaeologists would say. Um, I think the typical story is that, well, mankind uh, were, were cavemen, say, you know, at about 8,000 BC or something, and then around 6,000 BC, suddenly mankind was sort of stepped out of his caves started building pyramids in Egypt and ziggurats in, mm. in Sumeria or something like that. But according to the myths and legends that I had uncovered um, and ancient Indian texts, that kind of thing, our history and the history of this planet and civilizations goes back many thousands of years more. Uh, easily, I would say, back to 50,000 B.C. or 100,000 B.C. In your investigations, have you come across any evidence of ancient technology and ancient artifacts that demonstrate a, a much higher level than, uh, you know, sort of rock carving and so forth? Well, I think uh, one strong form of evidence, I believe, is the actual ancient texts themselves. Um, it's interesting to look at the ancient Indian epics, the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, which relate a history that is very ancient. They, they'll say how old it is, back to 20,000, 24,000 BC, which is completely different than the history that, that, we're, that, that we're basically told, and it and seems very fantastic. Uh, a history of, of civilization on our planet and of a technology far in advance of certainly what we give them credit. Well, I've traveled the world going to various sacred sites um, and visiting various gifted people to uh, track down the new science aspects of these things. And um, one very interesting scientific project that took place during the 1970s was the so-called Dragon Project in England, where a number of mainstream scientists, the chemists and archaeologists, found very unusual energies emanating from some of the stones and some of the stone circles. Um, as measured by ultrasonics, uh, microwaves, infrared waves, Geiger counters, and so forth. And these energies were sometimes correlated with the solar cycle and the lunar cycle, uh, suggesting some form of physical astrology, if you will, as if the Earth were alive and responding to these celestial cycles at various particular times. It's as if the stone needles, uh, or the stone megaliths were like needles, acupuncture needles in the body of the Earth transmuting and transforming the energy of the earth and uh, my guess is uh, given this evidence and given the the, the powerful experiences uh, some of us have had in these sites um, is that th these so-called pagans or primitive people are were a lot more intelligent than we give them credit for the chambers and the perma cavity resonators cavity resonators mm. yeah some sort of a could be a transmitter of some sort, I'm not sure. One that picks up sound and oscillates in a particular yeah. sort of fashion? Well, I think they're probably um, activated by sound, by sound waves. Mm -hmm. But what the effect was after that, I don't know. But I've got a hunch that it's something to do with communication. The grid research of Bruce Cathy has focused on the grid's pulsing harmonic pattern and how that relates to UFO or skylight phenomena. 
It's not unreasonable to assume a pulse to the universe, an electromagnetic heartbeat, if you like. We are only now beginning to realise that certain ancient structures were in fact advanced tuning devices that tap these energies in a variety of spectacular ways. There are significant clues to suggest some sort of ancient harmonic sound technology. Parallel legends and shamanic traditions haunt the key power points on the grid. The mysterious time doors of the Amazon Indians, disappearing boats, planes and people, and stories of communication with gods. The Christian church in the, in the, uh, the ritual and the traditions and the architecture of Christian churches they were drawing on a lot of the more ancient um, realities. Uh, for example, in Europe, you, you'll find that a lot of the oldest churches from the Dark Ages and the early medieval period, they were all, they were all sited on prehistoric sites. And they were oriented according to the same kinds of principles as um, places such as Stonehenge were oriented. I think ancient people were aware that in order to bring about human evolution, uh, that they needed to empower, amongst other things, places, uh, because the power places are rather like the, uh, the acupuncture points of planet Earth. And if you um, carry out certain kinds of acts at those acupuncture points, then you influence planet Earth in all sorts of different directions. I didn't know at that stage that the, the Earth had two magnetic fields. It's got, we thought there's only one, but there's two, which are, are uh, running through each other in opposite directions. Did and you get the grid intersection points? Well, that, that's what I think. It's made from the two magnetic fields. When they, they're travelling through each other, you get vortices, trillions and trillions of vortices, I think, which make up the atomic structure. And the actual pattern if you look at it um, afterwards, it forms a grid pattern. So I think it's the actual, it's the magnetic field that, that creates matter. You see, in my physics I can show that the vortex is not only the particle of matter, but it's also space. Space is the very thin extension of vortex energy beyond matter, the particle of matter is simply the very dense center of the vortex. So the space-time world in which we live is created by movement at the speed of light. You can possibly use the system itself to affect different parts of the world, if you know about it. Oh, yeah. no, no, which which is, um, you can possibly use the system itself to affect different parts of the world, if you know about it. In his Tour de Force book, The Keys of Enoch, scientist Jim Hurtak presents a metalinguistic code document that synthesizes the occult, spiritual and scientific knowledge of the ages. Dr Hurtak details the ancient grid system and proposes 12 time warp vortex areas on the grid. These 12 key vortex areas around the world are described as some kind of dimensional switch points of proto-communication that were used by our progenitors, the gods of old, who came to these places to help and teach humanity. Well, James Hurtak's um, input into the situation comes from several directions, one of which is his vast academic input um, through his several doctorates in many fields, including ancient languages and uh, his work with uh, all of the scriptures of the, the ancient scriptures of this planet in the original languages, which he is able to read and understand. And he's done translations from Tibetan and whatever. The other part of his input comes from personal transcendental experiences that he has had, 
relating to an interface with an intelligence greater than the one walking on two legs on this planet. And the combination of the two uh, forms the basis for his work. Now, where I personally interface with him in this work, and I must tell you that the, the work um, that is to be done is so complex and so varied that uh, there's no one person who can grasp it all. Much of it's very scientific and very specialized. Where my own sort of sole response has been is in the use of ancient chants, mantras, invocations, which appear to be designed as more than just uh, pretty songs to please the ear, but for purposes of um, protection for one, and also for generating the, the, the energies which will create a protection around one, and also for uh, triggering off um, a search for uh, a better way of viewing things. Uh, a lot of these ancient sounds, I feel, uh, have come down as part of a, a very high science of sound. You're in fact describing which we've lost. an ancient technology. An ancient science of sound technology which we have lost sight of. <laughs> straight to the point, what are the keys of Enoch and why does this body of research uh, feature so much in this whole thing about uh, the Earth's grid and nodal points and sacred places and so forth? Why is the keys of Enoch such a, a critical body of knowledge when it comes to understanding all of that? Well the keys of Enoch present a succinct and complete body of knowledge, a body of knowledge that tells us who we are, where we came from, where we're going and indicated through a series of uh, for want of a better word, prophecies, modern prophecies, very accurate, precise prophecies. Keys of Enoch is a body of knowledge that was given through a gentleman called Dr. James Jacob Hurtak, who had an off-world or interdimensional experience with this higher intelligence. And they took him into another space, filled him with this information and sent him back and basically said, you've got very little time left. There's a geocataclysm of the 10th magnitude coming and you have to instruct your scientists with these 64 keys which will give each of your sciences its true orientation and direction to prepare you for what's coming up. Now the keys then were divided up, they, they operate in different levels, some on genetics, some on astrophysics. The key that we took to work with in relationship to the idea of sacred sites and the grid were the keys that described the grid and described its function and described how it was used in the past by other civilizations and how the people of this time prior to this cataclysm would be able to rediscover the dynamics of the system and also that coded in stone we would find the instructions left behind. I like the cliche of, well how do you want it, written in stone or what? And these are the things that have been discovered all over the planet in these sacred places are coded in stone, uh, ethnological museums with uh, various heads and fronds and so forth. And, and this, is, this is how it relates to the ancient knowledge of This is exactly peoples. how it relates to the ancient knowledge. These beings that are described in the Keys of Enoch are the beings that came from cycle upon cycle upon cycle and initiated races and development of uh, evolution and civilizations. Some of the races went from Alpha to Amiga and were able to leave this dimension altogether in total. Other races like our own have kind of stumbled through time and risen to heights and then catapulted into the depths again. It's curious to note that the recurring Atlantis myth 
can perhaps be traced back to some ancient technological endeavour that went terribly wrong. Many of the world's indigenous people who share parallel traditions and ancient legends say that the earth energy field is damaged in some way. The Australian Aborigines, the Tibetans and the Hopi Indians point to nuclear testing and the high-tech mining at key nodal points having a dramatic effect on the earth grid that could have grim repercussions, as happened once before, long, long ago. In fact, the old people say the big blow is coming again. If the mining disrupts the Rainbow Serpent, Boami, which is the energy grid, then they were very afraid that they would lose that particular part of the cultural teachings, mm -hmm. the maintenance of the earth and all that sort of stuff. Because um, without that energy grid, then the te teaching sort of just stops. The Missing Links documentary project has become an ongoing exploration and networking process to collect the fragments of ancient knowledge surviving through indigenous and Aboriginal people that could offer real hope for an ailing planet. The project originated with a special meeting of Aboriginal elders from all over Australia in 1976, who decided the time had come to reveal the secret knowledge, because if they didn't, the planet faced imminent destruction. Under the direction of Elder Aboriginal shaman and teacher Lorraine Matthew Williams of the New South Wales North Coast Bundjalung tribe, a small group of black and white researchers, filmmakers and alternative media people have been conscripted into the investigation of ancient legends, myths and traditions. In part two, we travel out to Grid Point 44 in the heart of Australia's Flinders Ranges to the central harmonic grid point, the energy vortex that all the ley lines in Australia radiate out from. There, we'll examine the enigmatic discovery of 40,000-year-old hieroglyphic writing. We'll talk to a few people about the implications and see if we can't get a bit closer to this ancient harmonic sound technology. <laughs> 